In step 2 of the Sugiyama algorithm, we want to find a level assignment for our vertices. Here the input is an acyclic digraph that we get from step 1. And we want to compute for every vertex the y-coordinate. So we want to compute a mapping of the vertices to numbers between 1 and n, such that for every edge, the y-coordinate of the source is smaller than the y-coordinate of the target. Here we place dummy vertices whenever we cross a layer that we will need in the further steps. There are many things we can optimize. Usually we want to minimize the number of layers, that is the maximum y-coordinate. Or we want to minimize the length of the longest edge, which can be described as the maximum over all edges of the y-coordinate of the target minus the y-coordinate of the source. Or we might want to minimize the width, that is the maximum number of vertices on a single layer, or the total edge length. And there, instead of taking the maximum, we sum up all of those, or we can just take the number of dummy vertices that we created. Now, first we want to have a look at the minimum number of layers. There is a simple algorithm for that. Let's take first any source of our graph. This source we can place on the bottommost layer. Now all the other vertices, they must be on a larger layer than all the vertices that have an incoming edge to this. And we will pick the lowest one that we can. So for every non-source, we set the y-coordinate as one more than the largest y-coordinate of all its neighbors with an incoming edge. So here the 4 and the 5 only have orange incoming neighbors, so they can be placed here on layer 2. The 6 has an incoming edge from 4 and 5, so it can be placed here. 7 has one from 6, so it can be placed here. And the observation we have is that the y-coordinate of every vertex now is just the length of the longest path from a source to v plus 1. And this is actually optimal. We cannot do any better than this. And we can implement it in linear time with a recursive algorithm. So if we look at this example here, we have this directed graph and we actually have this path here. And since all the edges here must be drawn upwards, there is no way to reduce the number of layers. And that means we get an optimum algorithm here and we can do it in linear time. The recursive implementation here is very simple. You just start from any sink and you look at the y-coordinate of all the incoming neighbors and if you don't have them, you just recursively compute it and you do that until you have the y-coordinate for everything. Now let's have a look at the total edge length. To minimize that, we can formulate a so-called integer linear program. In integer linear program, we have some target function. Here, the target function for us is the sum over the difference of the y-coordinates for all the edges in our graph. And then we have some constraints. Here, the constraints are that the difference has to be at least one for every edge, that every edge has a positive layer, and the integer part here says that all these variables have to be integers. In general, it's MP-complete to solve an integer linear program optimally. But this is a very special one. And here, actually, one can show that the constraint matrix is totally unimodular. If you remember back to the chart algorithm, we had this system of linear equations. And this here is also a system of linear equations. So if we look at the matrix that we get from the system, if we can show that it's totally unimodular, then the solution of the relaxed linear program is integer. First, what does that mean? Um, matrix is unimodular if its determinant is either minus 1, 0, or 1. And it's totally unimodular if it's a square matrix and 
Also, all of its square submatrices are only modular. So whatever square submatrix you take, you always have determinant minus one, zero, or one. We don't want to prove that here. But basically, if you have many zeros and everything else is ones and minus ones, then chances are pretty good. And then you can many times prove that things work out. And this part here means if we strike out this part, we don't require everything to be integer. And we just solve this linear program here. A linear program we can solve efficiently in polynomial time. And if it's totally unimodular, then we even get an integer solution. So for this very special ILP, we can just take the relaxation, don't require everything to be an integer, just require everything to be at least zero, and we get an optimum integer solution. So we can minimize the total edge length in polynomial time. The thing is, if we just minimize the total edge length or the total number of layers, then our drawings can be very wide. So now we don't have high drawings, but still this does not look very good. So instead, we can also minimize the width of our layers. Or we can say, I don't really care how high everything is, but I want at most 10 vertices in every layer because that's how much I can fit on my screen. I can scroll up and down to see things, but I don't want to scroll in two dimensions. So we can have the problem leveling with a given width. Here, our input is again an acyclic digraph and some parameter w that gives us the width of the drawing that we want to obtain. And the output is a partition of the vertex set into a minimum number of layers, such that every layer contains at most w elements. If we don't care about the height, then it's pretty simple. We can just put every vertex on its own layer and we're done. So, Finding the minimum number of layers while also having this constraint, that's not that easy. To solve that, we want to have a look at a completely different problem first, which is the so-called precedence constraint multiprocessor scheduling. That sounds intimidating, but it's not that terrible. This is on a very, very simplified level what an operating system does to control what processes are running on your CPU. So what do we want to do here? We have a set of jobs. And we have n jobs and each of them takes one time. We have a bunch of identical machines that's usually your different cores in the computer and we have a partial ordering on the jobs. The partial ordering means that for some of those jobs we have a requirement that this job has to be done before that. You can also imagine that you want Let's say in the morning you want to put on your clothes, you want to put on your underwear before you put on your pants. So you have some restriction there, put on the underwear first and then put on the pants. Or you want to build something, then you first have to create the tools and then you can build something larger from that and then something larger from that. So for some of those you have an ordering, but some of those you can do in parallel. That you don't care. And now the goal here is we want to find a schedule. So we want to respect this partial ordering and we want to have the lowest total processing time. And this is basically just a different description of this problem. The partial ordering adjusts the directed edges. The identical machines is just the number of vertices we can put on every layer. And the processing time is the total number of layers that we use. So we can use any solution that we have for this problem and directly apply it to our problem. The thing is that this is MP hard. But there are some approximation algorithms. In particular, there is a 2 minus 1 over W approximation. That means for every W, we can, in polynomial time, find a solution that has at most that much more processing time than the optimum. So if w is a 2, then this is a 1.5 approximation. If w is a 1, this is 
even optimal. Clear, you can just put a one vertex everywhere. If W is 100, then this is a 1.99 approximation. So if W gets large, this gets very close to a 2. But that also means we're never worse than twice the optimum. On the other hand, it is known that there is no 4 over 3 minus epsilon approximation for at least three machines. So there's no way, unless p equals mp, to find a polynomial time solution that gets closer than 4 over 3 times the optimum. I want to briefly sketch how this approximation algorithm works. So let's say we have our job stored in a list, in any order, for example, topologically sorted. And for every time slot of the schedule, we have at most w available chops. And a chop in our list is available when all its predecessors have been scheduled. As long as we still have free machines and available chops, we take the first available chop and assign it to a free machine. Well, this is basically the most greedy of all greedy algorithms. You just take whatever you can and place it in the machine and don't care about anything else. So, let's have a look at our job. We have some precedent graph. This is basically our acyclic diagram. Now we look at an example where we just have two machines. So what do we do? In the first step, we can only pick the first one because all others have some precedence. So in the first step, we put on machine one, job one, and on machine two, nothing. So we cannot pick number two in the beginning because of this edge. But now two, three, and four are valid, so we pick two and three. And then the next step, we can pick number four, but not five, because we're missing this edge. Next step, we can pick number five, but not number six, because of the red edge. Now we can pick both. We can pick these two, these two, these two, these two, and then we have one left in the very end. But how can we get a good approximation factor from this very simple algorithm? That I briefly sketch to you the arch of the lower bound. So we want to find a bound on the optimum based on our algorithm. So optimum is the size of the optimum solution, so the number of layers in the optimum solution. This is at least n over 2. So in the best case, in every layer we have all the machines used. So here n over 2, in general it's n over w. Also, the optimum is at least the number of layers of this graph. So this is the graph that we get, for example, from the solution in the very beginning, where we just want to minimize the number of layers. Okay. Now, we want to measure the quality of our algorithm using the lower bounds. So we want to find an upper bound on the quality of our algorithm. This is the number of layers on the time that we take for our algorithm. So look at our solution. And we insert some pauses here. So in every layer where some machine is not used, we insert a pause. Now how many pauses can we have here? You can see here we needed a pause, we could not he choose the two at the same time as the one because they are not in the same layer. Could not choose these two at the same time, these two at the same time. So for every layer, it might be that we require one pause. So for every layer we have, for some time slot, one of the two machines might not be used. So if we only have one layer, then we can use everything. That means that we get n over 2. And for every additional layer, we need a little bit more time. And the little bit more time we need is just the number of layers divided by 2, because one of two machines is not used. So the upper bound we have is n plus l over 2. That's approximately n over 2 plus l over 2. And now we can plug in this here. This is at most opt this is at most opt up 2, so the whole thing is at most 3 over 2 times opt. And if we have more machines, we have, don't have 2 but we have w, then this here is w minus 1 divided by w. 
So in the worst case, if we need some pause, then w minus 1 machines might be unused. And then we get this approximation factor in the general case.